Hello, everyone, and a very good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you very much for coming along to this webinar discussing Research Integrity Concise, a quick and efficient course on the key knowledge and major themes within research integrity. We should be taking about 45 minutes of your time today, including the opportunity for a designated question and answer session at the end. If you are familiar with the GoToMeeting software that we are using, you might know that there is a question option as part of the panel on the right-hand side of your screen near the bottom. If you would like to ask questions as and when they occur to you, please feel free to type them up and send them over via the pane where there's quite, we'll be quite happy to take those as we're going through. We'll also be making a recording of this webinar available. So if you wish to view it again or share it with your colleagues, that would be an option for you. It will be available um, early next week. At the moment, you are all on mute because the feedback can sometimes affect the quality of the sound. So if you do have any questions or issues that you would like, please do so in the question panel on the right-hand side of the screen, and I will be able to answer them. Now, so firstly, just a couple of introductions. That's me on the right. I am Anne Marie and the marketing manager at Epic G. I work mostly with the research program and I work on the campaigns, conferences, and webinars such as this. So now I'm going to let Professor Nicholas Stenick uh, introduce himself. Hi. Uh, hi there, uh, group. I can't see who's on and how many are there, but uh, uh, hi from uh, just Turning evening in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I know some of you, some of you don't know, but I'm glad you're online and then uh, look forward to the presentation. As we move on, um, our agenda to, before we get started, first I will be providing a bit of background on Epigeum itself, we're the organization that put together the programs through a collaborative model, and then once I'm finished, we'll move on to Nick's presentation, RI Concise and Impact, Objective Designs and Future Plans. After that, We'll wrap up with a Q&A session, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, please feel free to type any of your questions. So firstly, Epigeum was founded in 2005 as a spin-out originally from the Imperial College of London. Our two founders created a company in response to what they felt was a lack of timely support for researchers. One of our founders was doing a PhD at the time while we're also working full-time and he came across issues that he wanted and needed to be advised on. And it would either be that there would be a face-to-face -face course in three months' time that was being offered, or that there was an inadequate, dated, or boring material online that didn't quite fit what he needed. So he saw this as an opportunity to work with universities to create supported materials for, research for researchers, particularly PhD students and postdocs like himself, that gave just-in-time support for all those issues. And that's where Epigeum started in this sort of research arena with higher education. In the past 10 years since, we have expanded to studying programs, courses for students, and teaching and leadership programs, programs for staff, of which this is one. Of. Recently, we were acquired by Oxford University of Press in May 2015. Oxford University Press are actually a division of Oxford University, so we're still within the non-for-profit organization in higher education context and still very much focused on creating high-quality materials. To date, since we have been formed, we have created over 92 courses for over 19 countries and, and currently seven in development. We are increasingly globally focused organization. We have worked with just over 30 institutions across Australia and New Zealand as well. And this is a map to show you what our countries we have been involved with in the development of our courses. I would, I would like to briefly touch on implementation here, which is how the courses can be used for your institution. Firstly, it can be used as a standalone academic course. You can supply the student with an online multimedia rich course immediately at the time and place that they need it so that they would be able to work in the self-study mode. The advantage here is that you can make the course quite personal and release training on demand and so it is the most flexible option of the three. 
Secondly, in the middle, we have the option for tutor-supported online courses. There is plenty of supplementary material available as part of the course, which can be used to, by tutors to enhance the course. Tutors can be used to provide feedback that cannot be provided by computers. They can work on community-based features, give motivational messages, etc. So there's a whole tutoring side to the course that can be used if you have the tutors. The advantage here is that the course will be allowed to be more efficient, but you would be lose flexibility as you would tend to have a fixed start and an end time. Now finally, and this is the most common use of our courses and programs, is that it can be used as part of a blended learning program. Typically how this works is that the students are getting access to the online course ahead of a workshop, and then the workshop would really focus on consolidation and application of the materials. This is considered to be maybe the most effective pedagogically, but also the least flexible. Thus, you have a spectrum here for the most flexible to the left to the most effective on the right. You can also implement the course in all three modes at once of, over the course. So together, these three methods of implementation provide you with quite the armory to get your students the support and knowledge they require. Hopefully that gives you a bit of background on Epigeum and how we put the programs together. We'd be happy to talk a little bit more about this later, but for now, I'd like to hand it over to Nick. I'm, uh, again, Nick Stenick. I'm the uh, lead advisor for research integrity and also the new impact program. And uh, I'm going to talk about both of those this evening. Uh, or this morning and be glad to answer any questions you have. So as a brief overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about objectives and design, particularly of the research integrity course and where we're going with the research integrity course. Uh, I want to give you a brief idea of the evolution of the course and looking uh, forward with it. And then uh, an overview of the new concise course, which is a shorter version of the research integrity course and then talk about some of the new features that we're building in certification, the impact program itself, I'll explain what that is, and then uh, lay out what our plan is for the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, as you can see, what other lines we're going to, uh, courses we're going to bring online to supplement the basic research integrity, the concise course, and other courses that we have. So um, with online courses, uh, typically the design philosophy is if you want to create a course, is you start with the content, you put that content up on a few screens, uh, so you essentially take a book and you put it on the screens, you add a test, and you've got a course. <laughs> and that's what m much online training is. And so you kind of ask yourself at that point, um, well, is all the content necessary that's on in some of the courses? Uh, have learners actually learned anything from this approach? Uh, will the learning make any difference? Is this approach to training actually working? Uh, and I think as you uh, probably know, uh, and from the opening, is Epigeum uh, reached the conclusion that we could do better with online training. And so Epigeum uh, early on developed a very different approach. Uh, we start with development groups, and that's groups of universities who see a training need and can't themselves to develop the courses uh, and turn to Epigeum to do that. That development group lets us develop a series of interactive screens. And I'm hoping many of you have either are using some of our courses now or have a chance to look at them. If you don't, you can get a chance to look at them afterwards. <laughs> We're now adding to that a rubric-based certification system. So the certification is more meaningful. Uh, we also uh, deliver blended learning, as was uh, just mentioned. And what we're now developing is the impact system. And the impact system is a way of getting outside the course and observing what's going on. We track participation and certification. Uh, we take uh, surveys on learning satisfaction and the impact of the learning. And we gather information on institutional climate. So the courses now come as courses, online courses, blended learning, but with this new impact system built in. And this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, the evolution of the Research Integrity course is uh, it, it all started around 2010, 2011, when Epigeum decided that it would move into this area. It was hearing more and more that there was a need for training on research integrity. 
uh, and it decided to develop some courses. Uh, our initial goal was to target beginning research students and beginning researchers. Uh, we wanted to provide a full learning experience, which included videos, interactive activities, extra reading. Uh, it was very uh, soon made clear to us that we needed different tracks because not all research is a chain. And uh, we needed national version because the rules are different. And we developed a UK global one, a US one, and an Australian one. Uh, and the early course was delivered primarily as files to put on a local LMS system for implementation. Uh, so that was the initial set of assumptions under which we developed uh, the uh, initial courses, which uh, some of you are already using. Um, the approach was, uh, I think, relatively well received, but it has some shortcomings. Uh, number one is training is needed for more experienced and staff. And the current course is really a bit too long for an experienced researcher to take. Uh, the LMS delivered courses are difficult for us to update. Uh, we can only do it every two to three years. Uh, we can't do it on a regular basis. And it's also difficult to assess the need for and the effectiveness of the training. Uh, we have very little say in it once it's on an LMS system. So all of the, 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 the uh, assessment is basically up to institutions. So the outcome is that we're in the midst of a significant enhancement of research integrity in related courses. Uh, and the concise course, which I'm going to talk about uh, next, is the first step in delivering training at different levels. Uh, and we're adding to that impact, which is a novel approach to certification and assessment. As I said, this is part of an overall up this entire uh, training area that we're working on. The concise course, the development uh, philosophy behind this is to provide essential information as concisely as possible for experienced researchers. That research, that learning should be on a need to know the basis, not setting thing out. Our audience for this is specifically experienced researchers, not new researchers. And we have uh, uh, some supplements, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, to the generic content. And we've included national policies. And we're improving certification. We're adding impact to it. So all of that's going on with the concise course right now. Excuse me. The course content for the concise course is basically the same as it is for the full course. Uh, there's an introduction. We go through planning, conducting, sharing, and professional. But the concise course now comes packaged with a series of supplements, uh, human participant uh, research, animal research, conflict of interest, safety and health, and intellectual property. And I need to point out that the human participant course is a short introduction. It is not the full course that a researcher needs if they do human subjects research. We do have a course for that. Uh, for US researchers, that's not yet been adapted to Australia. But this short course here, these su supplemental courses, are about five to six screens. They're very short introductions. What do we mean by a need to know learning or a need to know basis? Well, if you were going into the section on planning, uh, the page would come up with some flip, flip cards and say, you need planning for plans and protocols, institutional approvals, and professional agreements. If you're an experienced researcher, you probably know all about. If you don't, you flip the cards out and find out more where you need to know. So the learning is on a need to know basis uh, based on a very short outline that goes through. So the next topic that comes up is agreement. And the agreements is on a tabbing basis at this point. So you might use an agreement for authorship, for supervisor-mentor relationships, for sharing data or collaboration. Well, what do you mean an authorship agreement? You click, and there's a brief summary of what's meant by that or what sharing means. The tabs come up. So the course is basically built around this need to know what you get is an outline that you can go through in probably 25 to 35 minutes if you don't call anything up. The entire course may take 45 minutes to an hour to go through. And it's definitely designed for experienced researchers. 
putting the concise course into context, this is where we are at the present time. Uh, we're basically uh, moving from undergraduate to graduate to postdoc, beginning and experienced researchers. The full RCR course uh, is designed largely for graduate and postdocs. The concise course is up there for experienced researcher. These are new development groups for undergraduates and experienced researchers that are in process here. And these are the other courses that we've got for researchers, research skills, master's program, and so on and so forth. So that's where the concise course fits into where we're going right now. As for the impact, what I want to go through at this point is how the system works, and then certification, learning assessment, and climate assessment. Uh, and that's all part of the new impact system. <coughs> so uh, the impact system is an enhanced training system. We begin with our basic online training. Most courses would go through registration training and tests. What impact does is goes through registration. We collect some information about the learners. We do some pre-course testing, the training, some climate assessment, post-course certification six months out and even longer if we do it. So the contrast of this new post uh, approach is it's not just a check the box course you went through when you answered five questions, but it's rather a system that has more rigorous certification. We collect information on learner background, learner experience, institutional climate, and all of the data is collected by department and unit so that you can go down and analyze what's going on in your institution and it's benchmarked against other institutions so you know where you stand in comparison to others. It works as follows. So we have our learners, we start with our learners, and we have a place where we collect the impact data. So a learner registers for the course and they take the course. As they're taking the course, the registration information is fed over into the impact data, de-identified for most crucial topics, um, uh, so that we can then start to, to figure out what's going on. And then as they're taking the course, uh, we ask certain questions, and those questions in the embedded surveys go into the impact data. And that's what creates our, our data file over here for analyzing learning, climate, and other things. Then we give tests, and it's the tests that are used for certification. So everything is built into one, ex, uh, one, one program, uh, which is the, the full course that they will take. So the impact certification is based on rubrics and an extensive uh, question background. The certification system at this point, it is based on rubrics to sure coverage and we have 22 areas right now that we test on. We will eventually test on more than that, but right now we're testing on 22. There are five or more questions under each rubric to prevent cheating. A passing score can be set by the university. We'll provide a certain a certification at a certain level, but you can set your pass score whatever you want, and the scores will be reported to the university. And this is an of uh, the uh, rubrics and the questions that we have under them. So they're questions on advocacy, agreements, uh, conducting research, definition of RCR, institutional approval, interpreting misconduct, so on and so forth. And this is an example of the questions uh, that we have. So while planning research for which of the following areas is it advisable to develop some formal agreements? Do they understand where agreements are possibly useful? And there'll be five questions for each area on that, what uh, will form the basis of the certification. Uh, there are five or more random questions, and there are multiple choice, multiple, multiple choice, and true or false, uh, true or false. For the course assessment, uh, I want to go through pre-course, post-course, and six months at this point. So pre-course, we have a very short series of questions we asked. This is actually out of date by about two weeks because we've done some revisions on this. But we asked, what is your reason for taking the course? And then we got a couple of uh, very small knowledge questions. 
such as small misbehaviors in research known as questionable research practices have a minor impact on a research record when compared with serious misbehaviors such as fabrication and falsification, true or false. And what we do is we compare that question at the beginning with the answers at the end to find out whether they've actually learned anything because these are questions that we anticipate. There'll be quite a few wrong answers at the beginning. And again, we've modified those questions slightly uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, as we get this thing ready to go. And what will come out of that are uh, pre-post comparisons. So true and false. This is the concerns about serious misconduct in the research. Uh, or this is a different one, concerned about serious misconduct research are best discussed first with the person suspected of misconduct or an immediate superior before going to an institutional research integrity officer. True or false? Uh, my guess is most of you would feel it's false. The question is, what would, it, what would you think if this is basically is your pre-post outcome? So pre-test, most said, ah, this is true and afterwards they said not, post-test they go to, well, it's not true. That's a demonstration that there's been some learning on it. And what, what, we're, what we would suggest is that these changes will be able to help you assess whether there's been any meaningful learning from the course. And these are the questions that we're in the process of refining and, uh, and rolling out at this point. We also, excuse me, we also have some climate questions that we give. These questions are specific for each institution. They are collected at unit and departmental level, and they're benchmarked, as I said, against data from other universities. So you'll be able to go down and look right at the level of a particular department in a particular unit as to how people are responding to particular questions. Our goal is to understand our authors. So this is a poll question we've had up for a long time. If a co-author on one of your papers was found to have plagiarized a few sentences uh, and the paper had to be retracted, would you still list it on your CV or resume? And these are the answers that we've gotten so far. We have a US version and a global version. And you can see the pattern is fairly consistent. Uh, a few say yes, mostly say yes, they would mention it. But quite a few say no, they would just simply bury it and say nothing about it. And the pattern seems to be fairly consistent globally. The question is, why is there variation across fields? What is the difference between fields? And it's something interesting to speculate on. And there actually is one anomaly here, and that is engineers in the US seem to be the most, uh, the least open of anybody about uh, disclosing this. So if this sort of thing is coming back from your university, is there something you should do to change and improve your training? The idea here is you're not just giving training, but you're getting data back that helps you actually improve the training, go into departments, find out what's going on, and so on and so forth. We're also collecting data on researchers' attitudes. Uh, what do they think? What do they know? Uh, can these be aligned with institutional expectations? So we ask, how important are each of the following elements when planning your research? Protocol, institutional approvals, professional agreements, responding to questionable research blast, conflict of interest, conducting human or animal research. Um, and then we ask qu confidence questions about this as well. We ask questions about quality, about pressures. How is the quality uh, versus the quantity of publications balanced in your department? Mainly quality, equally weighted, mainly quality or quantity. And again, the question comes back, what would you do if this is what your institution looked like? One department is heavily quality, one department, number three, is heavily quantity. Would these results raise any concern? Would they make any difference? We think they would, and they would help you uh, develop uh, a, a, a research integrity program in a meaningful way on your campus. We ask questions about confidence and behavior. Are you confident that all of your research, all of the research you have published is based on reliable evidence? Very confident, equally confident, and, uh, equally weighted, not confidence at all. What would you do if you had a department where the confidence that uh, the research was based on reliable research was not very high. Uh, is this a problem? Why is the confidence lacking 
uh, should researchers publish without confidence in their data? So again, we're trying to collect data that you can use to go back and ultimately produce a profile for your campus of your individual learners, your institutional profile, and a professional profile. So what do your researchers know? How much confidence they have? What are their attitudes? What are their behaviors? Where are they on pressure? Where are they on whether you foster or don't foster integrity on your campus? And what about their profession? Is the profession important? Does it influence? Do they even care what their profession thinks or does? Is this an important role in their life? And what the impact program will do is produce profiles that you can use and compare uh, for developing your research and training. So our future plans at this point moving forward uh, are, I want to talk about development groups, compliance packages, and then I want to end with a topic that I know is important in Australia, hosted versus uh, LMS. So as I mentioned, this is what our current courses look like right now. And we have in process at this point two new programs. Uh, research as a transferable skill and advanced research skills. And these will fill in gaps at the undergraduate level and at the experienced research uh, level. Those are both open, uh, but they're not something right now that I'm talking about. I just want to make you aware that we're moving into that area so that we have more level specific learning uh, in the courses that we offer for research. The compliance package that we're putting together is as follows. Uh, right now we're developing it for the U.S., but we will develop it uh, uh, for others later. So it's essential that all researchers have RCR, and we now have that available uh, as U.K., U.S., and Australian versions. Uh, we have basic and advanced. We have impact versions, and we have the five supplements. So RCR is already handled. Human subjects protections is what we call it in the, uh, in the U.S. It can be research ethics of some kind. It's advanced training for people who do human subjects research. Uh, we have that available in the U.S. It covers three approaches to research, bench, clinical, and social. Uh, it's got two perspectives, the researcher perspective and the IRB perspective, and we're planning to develop some special material for the U.S., which is the plant. Uh, but this is a course that has already exists and could be uh, developed as an Australian version without too much uh, trouble at all. Uh, we're also going to adapt the GCP course that we have, good clinical practice course that we have in the U.K. <laughs> we will produce a U.S. version in 2017 and also an impact version. Uh, and again, this could be produced as an Australian version. And then the one final thing that we lack is the humane care and use of animals or animal research. And again, uh, the plan is to have a U.S. version of that in 2017 as part of an advanced package. Uh, and again, all of these can be developed in Australian versions depending on the interest. Uh, we can't do it for a single university, but if there's group interest, we can do it. But what we're moving toward at this point is a kind of a total package uh, which will have uh, these main components. And we also now have export controls, intellectual property, conflict of interest uh, in the mini courses and the concise course. Finally, there's this issue of hosted versus LMS. Um, we are moving toward hosted. Uh, and the reason we're moving toward hosted, as I mentioned, is that it's much easier for us to implement the impact program and to update our courses uh, if it's hosted. What it does is it impairs your ability to localize the courses. So uh, as I said, we're doing it because it's easier to update and keep current. Uh, we feel it's more efficient for the universities because you have to do the updating, and very often that's ha hard. It's essential for the impact system uh, because we've got to collect cumulative data. So we need to move in that direction. The question is, does hosting mean an end to local content? And the answer is absolutely not. 
uh, that we already have national content covered in our national screens. And if you look at the concise course, you'll see that every one of those courses and supplements has a generic course followed by a very specific national screen. And we have Australian screens already for all of the material in the concise course. So national content is not a problem. The local and institutional content can be covered in openings and closings and other screens. And what I suggest that you think about is that uh, reorganizing your local content at the beginning and the end might actually make it easier to use and access. And for that, I'm going to close by uh, with this illustration. We have in the past delivered our courses and encouraged you to bury the content or link the content throughout the course, because that may be where it's the most relevant. What I'm suggesting is, is that you could move that content to a, a really engaging opening screen with your policy and a very engaging closing screen with it. Why would you want to do that? Well, what happens if your learner comes back and says, oh yeah, I remember I'm supposed to report misconduct someplace. Now where was I supposed to report it? How would they find it by going back into the course versus going to some of the local, to a, a beginning or ending screen? that by properly moving this stuff and organizing it, um, what I'm suggesting you think about is it may actually become a more effective device of having people come back and use what they learned in the course on a practical day-to-day -day basis when they make decisions about research integrity. <laughs> we can still develop the courses, deliver the courses for your local LMS, so that's not going to go. But what I'm saying is, is that we are slowly, for what we feel are good reasons, moving in the direction of hosted. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk with any of you further about this if you have questions about how it can be done and, and, and what the advantages and disadvantages are. So with that, I'm going to stop and see if there are any more questions. And I'm uh, glad to answer them now. And there's my email address if anybody wants to email me and, and ask some specific questions. Right, so we are now going to the Q&A section. Um, does anybody have a question for Nick? They'd like to ask. Right well, if you don't have a question right at the moment, we will be attending iNORMS on September 11th to 15th. Jane Wolnar, our sales rep, will be attending as well as Dr. Sarah Grant who is with Epigeum editorial staff. She, as you can see now, here are some contact details um, for the RI Concise. If you would like any more information about Research Integrity Concise, or if you are interested in accessing the course yourself, you can contact um, Jane or info at epigeum.com to provide a free trial. We will also be sending out a recording of this presentation to you so you can share it with the relevant colleagues who may find this of interest. Um, so thank you all so much for attending the webinar today and hopefully uh, you will be attending iNORMS and you can speak to Jane and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much for your time today.